Look, what about inverting the constitutive equation? So doing what we did in the elasticity, in the uh, isothermal elasticity, which is from the stress strain constitutive equation obtain the strain stress constitutive equation. <coughs> well, from a general formal view, we said if we had this equation, we could multiply times c minus one both sides, and we obtain that this will appear an identity here, so this brought, this brings uh, epsilon, then we have c minus one sigma, this term will pass to the other side with a plus, and then this would be delta theta times c minus one beta. So that's the, the fastest way of doing it, okay? We can do now explicitly and find what is this and what is that, okay? Look, the difference again is that this is what we had in the isothermal case. And now that this part provides what are the strains that are produced by some stresses if we have no changes of temperature. And now the difference is that we have to add some term here. So the strains have a part which is depends only on the stresses plus, look, the sign here is plus. Don't mix that with that case in terms of stresses. In terms of the stresses, we have minus here. In terms of the strains, we have plus here. Something that is proportional to delta theta, so when the temperature doesn't change, delta theta is zero, and the equation remains as before, multiply c minus one times beta, okay? So this is the expression of the constitutive equation, and now let's call c minus one times beta, which is a tensor, a second order tensor, let's call it alpha. So by replacing c minus one times beta times pi alpha, we have the expression of the inverse constitutive equation for thermal elasticity, which says that the strains are one part, which depends on the stresses, plus the increment of temperature, which multiplies a second order symmetric tensor, which is alpha. This, this tensor alpha is gives a name that you are maybe more familiar with, is the thermal coefficients tensor. Are you familiar with the word thermal coefficients? It's something that says the amount that measures the amount <laughs> of the expansion of a free expansion of a, of a body subjected to a thermal increment. So this is what we call the thermal expansion coefficients, which is nothing else than C minus I one times beta, beta being the thermal coefficients that we saw before. So to see what are these expressions in the case of the isotropic problem, C minus one has this expression in terms of the Poisson ratio and the Young modulus. And then C minus one times beta, if we do the operation, it comes out one minus two nu divided by epsilon multiplied by uh, beta. So now we can replace that, uh, that we can replace that, and we obtain finally that the expression of the strains is this one. This is the one, the Hooke's, the inverse Hooke's law. The stress, uh, strains that are produced by the stresses in the isotropic case in terms of the Young modulus and the Poisson ratio. And here, with a plus, we have some additional strains which are proportional <laughs> to the increment of temperature and to the thermal coefficient. This thermal coefficient, which is thermal expansion coefficient, is related to the previous thermal coefficient beta through that formula here. Alpha is equal to one minus two nu times divided by e times beta. So once we know nu and e, and we know one of these properties, we can pass to the other property uh, just by replacing in this formula. So, uh, looking at that, I, want, I would like to bring here some important concept, the concept of thermal stress and thermal strains. So again, this is the expression of the stresses in terms of the strains for the uh, no isothermal case. And this is the same expression for the thermoelastic case. So you know that the difference is that. 
So we call that part here sigma no NT, non-thermal, non-thermal stresses. So non-thermal stresses are those stresses, that's the concept, that are produced in the body if due just to the strains. But these are not the total stresses if we have some increment of temperature because they have to be corrected but a second stress tensor which we will term the thermal stress tensor which has this formula is proportional to the increment of temperature so in case of the null increment of temperature the thermal stresses are zero it's proportional to the thermal constant beta and proportional to the identity so this is the decomposition I would like to bring to your attention that total stresses in the general thermoelastic case can be split into the non-thermal stresses which are related to the strains in, in the same way that they do in the thermoelastic, in the uh, purely elastic case minus some correction which depends typically on the increment of temperature and on the thermal property of the material. These are the non-thermal stress and this is the thermal stress tensor, a correction. So that's the, we have to keep in mind that the correction we have to do with respect to the isothermal case is just adding to the previous non-thermal stresses, subtracting these thermal stresses. The same for the strain. If we look at the strains that were given by the Hooke's law in terms of the stresses and in terms of the Poisson ratio and the Young modulus, in the isothermal case, in the, in the thermoelastic case, they are corrected by this term here, which is added. So we can conclude that the strains in the thermal case are the same that we would have obtained if there was no change of temperature related with the stress through the inverse Hooke's law, plus some additional term, which is very easy. is a diagonal term, a di diagonal term multiplied by the identity. By the way, just looking at this formula, what is the correction in the angular strains produced by temperature? Look at this formula and think of the answer. Look, 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 look at my question. What is the correction that the temperature, or what is the correction, yes, that the temperature does in the angular strains? Angular strains. So gamma xy, gamma oz, gamma xy. No, because this is diagonal. So this correction, and also this one, also uh, that one, sorry, that one in the strains, in the stresses, the corrections are only on the axial stresses or in the elongation strains, in the, in the, in the, in the strains at the at diagonal, okay? Out of the diagonal, this term is zero, it's isotropic, so this term only corrects the axial stresses, sigma x, sigma y, sigma z, and this term only corrects the strains epsilon x, epsilon i, epsilon z. That's also good to keep in mind. Only corrections in the axial stresses and the strains are done, not in the shear. Okay? So let's look to this table, which is quite representative of what I wanted to, to say, is that the general case in thermal, uh, in thermal elasticity is the following. The stresses can be split into a non-thermal counterpart, which is related to the strains uh, as it's done in the isothermal case, which is this, minus, minus a correction which is done just in terms of a diagonal tensor, which whose components are proportional to, well, the diagonal tensor in the isotropic case, otherwise it's not, it's proportional to the, to the, third, to the increment of temperature, and in the isotropic case, it's proposing also pro proportional to one constant, which is the thermal <laughs> property, affecting only the diagonal terms of the stresses. About the strains. The strains in the general case 
can be considered into have two, two components. One, a non-thermal component, which is related to the stresses as the, in the same way that we do when there is no thermal action. That one. This is the inverse Cook's law. And then has to be corrected in terms of the thermal expansion coefficient and proportionally to the temperature in that way. Okay? Well, that, that, there are some manipulations that can be done in this formula. For instance, I just can take uh, this formula here, invert it, and say that the stresses multiplied by C minus 1 both sides are equal to C times the non-thermal part of the strains. And these non-thermal part of the strains are the total, uh, the total strains minus the thermal strains, these ones. This is the formula that you can find in some books for numerical applications. So in finite element codes, the, this splitting is translated into the following. The stresses are equal to the material elastic properties tensor multiplied by the total strains minus the thermal strains. And the same, the same way can, do, can be done, a uh, similar operation can be done starting in this equation. For instance, multiplying by C minus 1 both sides, we obtain that the strains can be written as C minus 1 times the non-thermal stresses. And the non-thermal stresses can be written as the stresses plus the total stresses plus the thermal stresses. So this is the formula, these are the formulas that you may find in some finite element books or we are giving courses on finite element analysis of structures. This is more convenient for coding purposes, for keeping the structure, because then the only thing we have to do when the stresses are zero, when the, the temperatures are zero, is just to cancel this term here and also to cancel this term here. Okay? So this is the, but this is completely equivalent to that. I would like for our purposes that you keep in mind this expression. The stresses have a non-thermal part, a mechanical part, which are due just to the mechanical strains, to the strains mechanically related through the Hooke's law to the stresses, minus a correction, which is that one. And the, stress, the strains are, have a, no, a, a non-thermal uh, component the mechanical component of the strains plus 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 minus here plus here plus a correction which is done in terms of the increment of temperature and the uh, thermal expansion coefficient okay so what how does it changes how does it have to change our mind in thinking of stresses versus strains look for instance if we are in a thermoelastic problem, look, if we are in an elastic problem, in an elastic, purely elastic problem, we are used to say, well, if the strains are zero, the stresses are zero, isn't it? Well, we have to change our mind. Look, imagine that you have a, 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 a solid which is confined. It's confined in such a way that point by point, that the strains are zero. By replacing in the equation, in the equation that you have here, that, that means that the mechanical or the non-thermal component of the stresses are zero, but not that one. So we have just to subtract these stresses here, and the strains are still proportional to the increment of temperature. So there can be huge stresses just produced by the temperature, even in the case that there are no strains. That is the way we have to change our mind when you have stresses, when you have temperatures. And the same about the uh, strain. We are used to say, well, when there is no uh, stress, the strains are zero. If I take that object and I don't give him any stress, any force, any applied forces, I can say that the strains are zero. Okay? That's not true. That's not true in the thermal case. Why? Imagine a body like that, that is free to deform. So imagine that body here, whoop, that body here, and I put some increment of temperature inside. How is the body behaving then? 
What is your, your, your feeling? It's expanding. It's expanding. We'll talk about how is it expanding. But it's expanding. So the strains doesn't, uh, have, have, have increased. Even at no stresses, the stresses of the expansion will also be zero. Okay, so the paradigm that no stresses, no strains is now broken for the thermoelastic case. So if the stresses are zero, what are zero are the mechanical strains. The non thermal part of the strains, those strains here are zero, of course. If this is zero, that is zero. But it remains still this part which are the strains which are produced by the thermal expansion. And then the total strains would be this, would be, that will be zero, plus this, that will no longer be zero. So the strains will be the thermal expansion strains, which have this form, is an isotropic expansion, alpha delta t, delta t delta t1. 